Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Patricia Kranz. I'm the executive director of the Overseas Press Club, and we're so happy to be here. Um, the, the Press Club was started 77 years ago by um, foreign course Americans who were covering World War II, and when they came home, they wanted a place to get together and um, talk about their experiences, exchange tips and sources, and have a few drinks. Um, and over the years, the, the biggest acti biggest event we have is a, is a competition once a year um, where now we give out 22 awards for international journalism, primarily meaning um, journalism for an American audience, the re reporting that is done overseas. Um, three to four of the awards are for photography. Um, the others are for writing, broadcast, uh, now digital. Um, and we also have um, get-togethers and, and programs like this are programs where we um, have reunions of people who've covered a particular region like Russia or, or the Middle East. And we're more and more um, trying to do more programs um, that, that are of interest to um, people like you and um, young journalists who need uh, who don't have the support system that, pe that we had in the past, where more people have to be freelancers and, and sell their own work, find, find their own uh, uh, outlets. So um, tonight's program, uh, it's two of our governors, they're on the Board of Governors, Pancho Bernasconi from Getty and Bob Nicholsberg, a, a freelance photographer both with um, many years of experience and knowledge. So I hope um, that you can learn something. Good evening, thank you for coming. Uh, in the competitive world of photojournalism, awards mean quite a bit, not just getting published and earning a living, but at the end of every year, Photographers, at least for the part that we're discussing tonight, submit their picture stories and individual images to the awards committee and a series of panels. Uh, juries, for instance, are uh, convened to look at the stories, eliminate the ones that don't qualify or aren't up to high professional standards, and then ones are given awards. And then later in April, Patty may have mentioned awards are formally presented in New York. And they're quite prestigious, but what we wanted to do this evening is to show you the winning entries. Uh, the New York Times has had quite a massive year uh, in succession, actually, and they will probably again this year, as well as Getty Images and other wire services. So what, what we have tonight, at least with this John Faber Award, are, I believe, 12 images from four photographers. So the sequencing is very important, your first image is very important, your middle image is important, and your ending is obviously important. So the whole narrative structure comes through very clearly in combining four people's work, which is not simple to do, and have sort of a score as in music that works from the beginning to the end. So, uh, Pancho, if, sure. Sorry, just real quick. Thank Michael for having us here. And well, you guys know what a great man Michael Camber is, but just this place is really special, and what you guys are doing here is really great. Um, and before we show the work, too, just I was looking at the name of this uh, event tonight, and it's called uh, Tips for Aspiring Global Photojournalists. And I said to Bob, one of the first things about being a global photojournalist and being a local photojournalist. Everybody you're going to see up here is Mauricio, Sergey, Tyler, Daniel. They didn't just get to where they are by going overseas and making these photographs. They started by doing things that they knew around them, closer to them, um, in their neighborhood, in their building, in their apartment block, down the street. That's how all great photography starts, is you do what you know, and you work out from there in kind of concentric circles of learning, failing, learning some more, continuing to grow. So when you look at these things, don't think that you can't do it. Just realize where you are today and that you want to get someplace else. And all these folks started that way. 
um, an important lesson to remember that nobody gets to be this good immediately. It takes time and practice and failing and learning again. So. The major story for this award was obviously migration into Greece primarily, but also pictures were taken overland as people came out of uh, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan. These were all from 2015, mostly in September, October. So the photographers, and uh, hold on this one, Pancho. I think that the fellow in the blue, and that's his brother in the green. So there is some, <clears throat> automatically, you would look to the caption, for instance, on to see what what's the reason for this photo, obviously, but it, it's more elaborate collaborative in that these people are related and I think by luck or maybe by design I'm not sure if both of them. Uh, they were able to just then follow specific people as they made their trek this is on a train many of you may have seen these in the paper this was part of uh, it's not required that the images appear in a newspaper or a magazine publication This was a tear gas uh, attack at trying to break up the demonstration in Serbia. The Hungarian police were not allowing the refugees to cross. Refugees from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Morocco, Algeria, and Somalia struggling for donations of water, blankets, diapers, and some clothes on their 10th day in camp near the border in Greece. They were not allowed to cross into Macedonia. So there's a lot of drama and context involved here. So obviously the caption is very important, but we don't have them glued. They're part of the uh, file info in Photoshop, but for the awards, the jury would have a sheet like this to consult. One thing too, for you photographers out there still learning, is it's, it's called layered, right? There's lots of different points of view here. I think what's really important is photographs doesn't have to be perfect composed, right? You got bits and pieces of people coming and going on the edges. And I think all that helps add to the sense of tension and stress that everybody's feeling, but it's also layered, right? So it's not just something right in front of you, it goes back and there's depth to it. That again comes with you know being aware of it and knowing how to photograph it and being comfortable that you're not going to get all the bits and pieces of media people, but the parts you do, those hands coming out, the, the mouth, and the, look at the mouth at the top, all help kind of set the mood and give you a sense of the stress that they're under. So the, these are members of the same family that were on the train, the Majid family from Iraq. Here they're registering at a reception camp. This is probably the most famous picture to come out of this series. It's an Afghan boy off of Greece, just landing on Lesbos. So the, it turns out the photographers and the media were harassed quite a bit by police. John, do you, do you know in Those, fact? Uh, uh, a lot of the volunteers uh, that were helping uh, people come across uh, uh, or, or land there on the shore, they were they took it on, upon themselves to to keep the media away from the, the migrants, and so uh, and so there was a lot of hostility there. And Ray, that's John Moore, photographer for Getting Me, one of the finest photographers in the Thank you. I work I work I work for Poncho. <clears throat> Have any of you seen this picture before? What do you guys think of it? What do you feel when you see it? Okay. Well, I kind of feel like I'm in the water. Just the droplets are like suspended in the air. So it gives you like that effect that you're in the picture. Right? It's pretty, pretty amazing, right? I think Tyler was in the, in the water with him. I think he might have lost a camera too, John, right? Mm -hmm. I think, I think he dropped he his camera in the water. One of his cameras got trashed uh, in, in the sea water. A big wave came in and hit. Plus, there go your dry shoes. And there's something about that board's face, right? Yeah. You just immediately connect with, I can't even imagine what I'm seeing. Just kind of 
and show like that. So they came out of Turkey by sm with smugglers. So the whole concept of borders here, it, it's a little bit more interesting because it's a water border and a shore line as opposed to the Mexican border, for instance, or the Canadian border, which requires a different style of photography. But this certainly brought home sort of an invasion concept that how are the authorities going to deal with this? So some people didn't make it. This is the reaction having touched ground after the boat trip in Greece. One of the things too with great photography, it doesn't have to be, as I say, a, you know, a Michael Bay movie with things exploding and cars tumbling. It could be a real simple moment. And that's because you need to connect. That's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to get your photography to connect with other people so they feel what you felt when you were there. I'm pretty sure like that does it over and over again, right? So you can't help it connect with that father. This is part of the family that was followed, in fact, the Mochi family. And these are all the life vests that were probably sold to refugees in Turkey. So those are 12 images. And uh, can we go back to the beginning and quickly go through them again? And you can see, look at the beginning image, arriving, moving, sleeping, moving, running, struggling, sleeping, registering, arriving, dead, arriving, and your last image. So sequencing is very important. I think you could probably, like a deck of cards, move some of these images around, but this is your perfect thoughtful ending frame. Obviously requiring a caption. Do I have to say, I'm gonna come with that as a person now. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Daniel Berahulik photographed the earthquake in Nepal, which was uh, not on everyone's radar, but pretty horrific in the Himalayas. How many people here were aware of the Nepali earthquake? Okay, so a good portion. You can Anybody see, here have people, friends, or family affected by it? The buildings are not always built to standard, but I think the shape was pretty serious, too. Yeah. One of the things about being photojournalist or photographer that goes from their home to a situation like this, an earthquake, a war, a tsunami. Of course you're going there because you have a thoughtful line and you know how to tell the story, but also the amount of logistics that folks like Bob and John and Mr. Camber have been through in their careers. So much of what you do is not just photographing, but just figuring out how to have power, how to have water, how to have electricity, how to get a good Wi-Fi or a signal to send from places like that. So when you think about going overseas to do things like that, being a photographer is part of it, but being kind of like MacGyver is the other part of it, to figure out how to do those things. Also your jet lag, and here you have altitude to deal with. It's not, not that simple to get acclimated. And language. And uh, the authorities were not very quick in supplying relief. So the airport was closed for a long time. One of the things you want to do in a situation like that is give a sense of scale. So folks who don't really realize, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, if there was one thing that was Fifth Avenue, you see a sense of scale. So to show it against the rest of the city gives you perspective that you otherwise wouldn't have. Perspective is super important when you're trying to tell a story from places that most people haven't been to. Did a great job. So he managed to get out to the countryside, which was actually more cut off than people were aware of. 
roads were just shattered. All these rather basic structures collapsed. It was all by helicopter. So as a photographer, you have to get a ride on a helicopter, otherwise you're not going to get out there. So this, this frame in particular caused quite a bit of controversy. Those are American soldiers <clears throat> in the uh, Taliban controlled area. That's a Taliban that was shot and killed and then burned. And well, it still amazes me why they allowed or did that so openly and it created a lot of problems for that unit. Can you say what kind of problems? Can you expand on that? Human rights, for instance. Um, it documented uh, whether this person had been alive or given a fair shake, whether he was a prisoner of war. Why don't you go back to that? Yeah, the Americans burned him. The, the Americans, Americans soldier, burned him. Yeah. Which, which was the... And it's one of the few times that, uh, particularly with the, the 
embedding process that the press was able to see something as controversial or as negative or as perhaps illegal uh, against the Geneva Conventions as this. And I don't think Steve faced any retribution for this for working, or did he? John? Uh, he was kicked out. He was kicked yeah, out. The military kicked him out of his embed. Uh, for sure. That particular one. For that, uh, yeah, they they ejected him uh, for that, and without, and it didn't go against the rules uh, to photograph something that was right in front of him, and it, it wasn't an American casualty, um, so uh, it it was an unfair. He was unfairly kicked. But the picture was so strong that it caused a, a huge embarrassment to the U.S. military. Did he publish it right? They, uh, they, they soon after. Soon thereafter, yes. Okay. So the technique in a lot of cases, if he was on an assignment, it would be a judgment call whether you publish this right away while you're embedded or you wait till you leave uh, until you're out of the country or at least out of the zone in order to continue to work. Either way. It, it's quite a revelation to see this. I've not seen any situation other, other than harassment and uh, what, what John has photographed in Iraq, treatment of prisoners in Iraq. Not the brutalization, but... Um, and here, this is a, a Hasselblad, uh, sort of like a white Lux. What, Mike, what are they, the Hasselblad? Uh, I think it's the X-Pan. X-Pan. It's the one that yeah. it's perfectly crisp. Gives you an idea, again, of the ambiguity, perhaps, and the mystery of a soldier decked to his neck and head with only a little bit of skin showing and the Afghans wearing flip-flops, wondering who the hell G.I. Joe is. Hold on this. You'll, you'll notice his arms are both artificial. So Steve used all kinds of formats in this, horizontal, vertical, square, rectangular. It's pretty much just his personality. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really, this is really a sensational book. And it won the award. So the Robert Keppel Award is for bravery under extreme enterprise, under extremely challenging situations. Most often it's from a conflict zone, and that we have no shortage of those. In the news, it is uh, considered the most prestigious uh, photo award uh, for a particular story and groups, group of images, and we'll take a closer look. This is also rather um, indicative of what's going on in Syria today as barrel bombs are used, hospitals and clinics are targeted, schools are blown up. And this all took place in Damascus. This is probably the most incredible picture that is still viewable. A lot of people find it difficult to look at flood, but this, this was in December 13th, almost all of the pictures are from December 2015. There's no morphine, there's no power, there's no plasma, there's no blood, no bandage. It's just chaos. And it's a Syrian photographer in a field hospital. And the hospitals have been shelled by Assad's uh, forces. This is before I think the Russians entered. One of the criteria for the Kappa is that the photographer had personal risk involved, that he was in as much danger as some of the subjects in this photograph, which makes it, as Bob said, one of the most prestigious awards because it's a photographer that goes beyond what most would to make that photograph through their own personal safety. Risk and enterprise. Enterprise meaning get the hell out of there. After you get the right photograph. So from November 29th to December 13th. This is probably the calmest picture in the group. Go 
back through that if we can. Maybe not. One moment. Maybe check out the last set of the cap. Yeah. So the Assad government will also target wherever you're transmitting from because it could pick up signals on anyone using the internet. It was not that simple to get your pictures out. It's very dangerous. This gives you an idea of how good you have it <laughs> in, in most cases. So there you have to, as a photographer, you need to strike a balance of how much of the gore and emergency nature and the destruction, violence that you can show to an audience and also what you yourself can tolerate. Yeah. And there's no shame in knowing exactly what that is because everybody's different. Right. So that's a quick tour of the world between Greece, Nepal, Afghanistan, and Syria. It's not anywhere around the Bronx, but just gives you an idea that the world is round and news organizations take time to put these stories together. And a lot of the stories that you see here were eventually put into books, which is again what is on the table there and will eventually go upstairs to the center's library. So study whatever you can from these new books, they're, they're quite interesting, and um, as students. But um, I think the Overseas Press Club will try to donate whenever we get a box. Um, <laughs> every year, we appreciate it. Every year. You know, one thing I want to say to you, to you students especially is, is one of the things that's so, even I think after you know, 30 years of doing this, I started when I was 18, is photography gives you the permission to be curious about your world. So focus on that, whether it's you know difficult world or a more calm world, but it's also the responsibility to tell that story correctly. So you have the permission to be curious, but when you get that ability to go into people's lives, which if you continue to do this and you document stuff, whether here or wherever you end up going, this is you have that permission to go into people's lives. Treat them kindly, you know, and uh, because you're not the only one going in, there might be somebody else that comes in after you. But it's super powerful the way you can act. So it's a, it's a real privilege and uh, an opportunity to kind of be, you know, you get to go where most people don't ever get to go. And that's a great privilege and honor and uh, challenge. Yeah. Bob, John, all these guys, Mike, have been to places that otherwise, if they weren't photographers, they maybe not have a chance to go and see things. So it's a, it's a pretty special thing. Can we, uh, can we, can we take some questions? questions? Yeah, totally. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, any, any of our Bronx students have, have questions for these guys or for, or for John? Yeah. Well, I have a question for you guys. What made you take a photography class? The ones who are taking classes. It's okay, there is no one right answer. And there definitely is no stupid answer. Yeah, why don't you take this class? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, those are down the street. Put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> You're never in a shortage for a thing. Well, the reason I took this class was because I wanted to learn how to film. Basically, what you guys were mentioning, how like, being curious but also be able to capture a moment that you can, and you may see it differently as someone else. And you want to show others how you see that. Yeah. What about storytelling? It's something I wanted to, or both of us wanted to bring up tonight. And we have individual photos here that are sort of edited and sequenced into a story, not just a one-off picture and to drive home a point of actually the result of your curiosity as a story. But is, is any amount of time spent on storytelling in, in 
courses, or does that come later? No, we're they're, they're working on their final project now. So they say, yeah, so uh, that's already 12 or 10, 10, 10 to 15 photos. And so we're discussing how they're going to sequence them and write captions that give them context and such. Captions and So you also have a, a Renaissance man here. <laughs> being able to write very well, as well as photograph extremely well, too. So you're getting both. All right, so I'll, I'll use John as a warm-up. So John, why did you start with guitar? What made you curious about John when you started playing? Well, <clears throat> I started back when I was in high school, and um, I took a photo one course uh, because I thought it would be fun and easy. <laughs> that was the reason I started. So I started with no journalistic sort of, I want to be a great storyteller, I want to do you know, I want to try and change the world with a picture. I, I really started because it was an elective that I thought would be cool to do, you know, in my, in my mind at the time as a 15 year old. And I was, and I immediately found that it was. It was, uh, it was both of those things. And as someone who goes, like, like Bob, like Mike, goes to some of the difficult places where you've seen these pictures taken tonight, um, it, I would n never call it always fun anymore. And it's certainly uh, not easy, um, but it transformed over time from something that I thought would be cool to do to something that I still think is cool to do, but for a lot of other different reasons. You know, because you find out you find something that, that you you're kind of good at and you get better at it, and you're surrounded by other photographers who are really good at it as well, and you learn from them, and you make terrible mistakes um, sometimes. In the, the pictures come out bad, and sometimes because you almost get hurt because you did something silly. And you learn from those things, and you see your colleagues and your friends do that too, and you get to learn from their mistakes, which is much better than learning from your own. And, and you still do it years later, cause, uh, because you can not always change the world with a picture, but you can change the way people think. And that's kind of cool. And with, uh, with social media platforms that we have now, you don't even necessarily, um, you can tell a story right here in your neighborhood and you don't necessarily have to uh, be on assignment from a major publication. You can, you can do that story and you can put it out. And that story may not go viral around the country, but you will get a lot of eyeballs on it if you do a good job. And you can just put it on Facebook, you can put it on Instagram, you can do this stuff yourself. And um, then you get noticed. And then you go to other uh, employer uh, magazines or newspapers or agencies that want, that want to hire you because they say, wow, this person has a good eye and they can tell a story. It's, it's a long answer. Um, no, I think, but, but I think especially at the end, for everybody, it's important. The way you get noticed is so different today than it was when we were coming up. Right? There isn't like the formal, there's still is, but show the portfolio to the editor and then look through it, they call you a couple weeks later. Now with Instagram, I mean, you know, it's changed the dynamic and the process of how that conversation between the photographer, the editor, and the community that they're trying to reach are all jumbled, right? They're all, they're all the same and they're all different. It's a completely different process. So there are a lot more platforms now yeah. which to present your work, but this still remains one of the traditional platforms, sure. the annual awards, and in particular for photojournalism. It's probably not going to change, but it has to be kept alive by each and every one of us by students and the professionals, but as the New York Times is about to let go 200 more people this year, uh, Bloomberg lets go people, Reuters, all of the major hiring uh, companies, corporations in journalism are letting people loose. It's compressing and it's become more and more difficult to find these outlets. So a lot of it is based on your own enterprise and technology that we didn't have living in India for 12 years. I was 18 months behind constantly. Hong Kong, whichever came out first for phones or transmitters or modems, India was 18 months late in getting those things constantly. So all of these technological impediments do slow you down, but it also makes you a better photographer, a better writer, and more enterprising. And that's incredibly important. I think you see that here in the course that you're taking, or any course for that matter, how you can cut corners, but professionally, you're faster with better technology. But still being able to tell a story is incredibly important, the narrative. 
And you can see even with four photographers, they were able to put the point across of what it was like to land as a refugee. I just ran into a, a friend, a writer, Matt Akins, who as an American, with an American passport, smuggled himself with an Afghan from Afghanistan to Greece without a passport. Spoke no English, took no notes as a reporter. He used his phone, just like everyone else was doing during this refugee crisis, and he has a book contract. But he had to take notes on his cell phone and act dumb, couldn't tell anyone he was an American. He's half Thai, so he fits in very well, but no passport, no money, and he did it. It's going to take a book to find out how he did it. But, uh, so that's called enterprise, courage, I, tough to work with someone like that. Um, he used Hawala and how you smuggle money through the system, through Dubai, and there are certain points that money was uh, dropped off for him. And he got out, he was never put in jail. But a lot of this is not just having an extra pair of shoes, but having an extra set of uh, tools to figure out how you're going to work each day. And having the idea, too. You've got to have the idea. The execution is going to be buried by the number of people that think of it, but it's to have the idea that's the first trick. Do you guys have any more questions? Let's have some questions. We're not that comprehensive. Or any comments? Princess Leah, uh, Leah, you guys are never a loss for things to say. <laughs> Melody, anything you want to know about what you saw? Did any pictures jump out at you? Ellen? Well, uh, uh, we should tell these guys how, when you're a photographer, you work with a reporter. So my whole uh, career has been with a reporter. As a Time Magazine contract person, I had uh, essentially to serve a word-driven publication. That's pre-internet. And most writers, you can uh, almost officially say, have a more two-dimensional uh, view on a situation and a news story, and the photographer has to add the illustration. But with that comes a collaboration. And uh, as words became more easily transferable, so did imagery. We could put a photo essay up on the web. It didn't require 10 extra pages in a magazine, which is how I learned how to do it. But the access for photography changes, and it never took space away from words. I think some writers always had a problem that if there's a photo on a page, the words disappear. That's not always the case. They give it more space, but Alan, I think you might have heard of that kind of <laughs> potential run-in with pictures. Perfect. Uh, Absolutely, but I, as a reporter, I was always um, really helped by photographers who would actually conceptualize the story somewhat differently from the way I would. Reporters are looking for paragraphs. They're opener, they're closing. Photographers are looking for opening pictures also. But ask a reporter what they're thinking at any given time, and they're thinking word groups, some different angle, some adjective, some adverb. And photographers are basically doing the same thing, but in, with a different perspective. So it's often, I found, better to take separate cars than have one car, so you don't end up slugging each other by the end of the day. But, uh, you know, why are you stopping here? There's a photograph. Who cares? That's usually the comment from a reporter. Oh, I don't say that. Oh, uh, no, like no, it's quite, it's been said. <laughs> the other thing I think you should talk about is when I don't I, want to talk when I, and interview when I somebody that I can't take a picture of. So that, that whole conflict ends up, you get two cars. Fair enough. Right. Uh, two cars are only really better than one. So that's called a collaboration. <laughs> two cars. <laughs> but when I made the switch to television, See, then it becomes the, the uh, issue of putting those two mindsets together. Yes. And, and that's why I think it's really helpful for you to tell them how pictures drive the, the whole story, whether it's the words or the, they embody the theme somehow. What's really important. In the end, I, I, I believe that pictures gave the writer more space. If the picture was good, the page count went up. And, and I think that is never any more true than today. The world we live in is a visual world, right? The 
whatever we might think of the platform and what they're doing to the business, you know, you share and you see and you feel affected by the visuals around you. And I think the dynamic of words and pictures together will continue to evolve and change. And there is a dynamic of working together that's super valuable because you do feed off each other in terms of the Yeah, the, the words can't just say what's like Correct. Pictures. Correct. I mean, the, 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 there is a symbiotic relationship to words and pictures, and the story behind a photograph has a lot of value. I think what we're going to see in the coming years, you know, Bob was right that, you know, people are losing jobs and places are shrinking. At the same time, it's never been more open. The ability to connect visually with other people around the world, whether they're professionals or whether they have really a, a really awesome Instagram account in India, in New Zealand, up in Guinea. I'm from Chile. Like my family and friends in Chile and Argentina, I mean, the, the way you're connected with people and the way I think visually there's a lot more literacy today is because of all these platforms and I think you guys are going to be the beneficiaries of whatever happens next. Someone's got to ask a question. You can't be done. We can run these uh, through again if you'd like. Um, Tony, did any of the images jump out at you? Kayla? <laughs> My favorite part of this image was the shoe on the left. The shoe's pretty great. Oh, yeah. I think it took me like three times to see that. I was like, I don't know. You gotta see it big too. That's that's one thing. We're so used to seeing stuff on our phone. To see a picture big yeah. really does kind of change your perspective. It's nice to be able to do that, right? Not just look at it on your iPhone or your There's something about seeing a photograph, which is what's so wonderful about having books and having that library for you guys, is the nature of being able to flip through things at your pace and go back and feel that and see something big like that is really kind of it changes what you see in it. You know, I bet you if you saw that on your phone, you probably would never see the Poncho, go to another frame. The train, maybe. And try walking yeah. through that with your cameras. <laughs> Again, the layers, right? Just from beginning to end, just the way your eye never stops moving. Yep. That's a great thing. I mean, that's like one of the things that's so beautiful about photography is there's what I might think the picture that I want to take it, and then it goes out into the world, and everybody's going to have a different interpretation of it. And that's, I mean, it's a really extraordinary thing when one picture is read and viewed and thought about differently by so many people. It's one of the magical things about a still photograph. Can you talk for a moment or, or, or about some of these moments, what do you seem like decisive moments? Some of them are more powerful because they're moods or their compositions. I mean, there, there are different things that make these, these, you know, this is very different than the previous one, but can, can you talk about that at all? Well, this is a conglomeration of four people's work, so um, it, it's a little bit deceptive in a way. Um, one person would not have been able to do all of this so right. perfectly. And it's been edited to, uh, to its finest, so you couldn't even put a piece of paper between the pictures. It's so tightly edited. Um, I mean, some photographs have kinetic, sort of kinetic energy, right, energy in motion, and some have more potential energy, just energy that's sitting there waiting to happen. Like that's, there's energy everywhere, right? The water, you said the water is dripping off, the boy looking off in the distance, his mouth open. Then you have that, it's, it's energy, but it's more just kind of contained. You don't know what's gonna happen. You're kind of sure what's going on there, but not really. So, you know, every photograph has different kind of a force to it, an energy to it, the way it fills the frame, right? Sequencing is incredibly important in this particular essay because there was a lot of potential violence and 
shoving and moving and abuse by the police, but at the same time, the struggle of the people trying to flee a situation very often much worse than what they're facing now turns into something much worse than they probably left, other than the violence, say, of, of Syria. It was very tough to show the scale of refugees and migrants, so a photograph like this does a really good job. You know, it's very simple. It does a really good job of telling you the numbers of people, right? It's, and it's very different than this. You don't have a lot of people, but you have that emotion and that the father holding his son and the guy holding his nose and the tear gas in the background. They all have different qualities, and there's no one thing that meets one picture better than the other. It's just they all have different intensity, different energy going through. Do you have a question? Um, I have a question about maybe the photographer's thought process when uh, choosing to uh, include certain photos. So for the last photographer, he included a photo of a syringe where he's on like a few rocks. Yep. And my it jumped out at me because I was wondering why they decided to include that photo specifically because in all the other photos, they really they really jump out at you. You could see emotion just screaming from the photo, but that just, it's just a simple syringe and that really made me wonder, well, the syringe just shows a lot of age and stuff, but I was wondering why they chose that instead of maybe a photo of another person or a child. This one, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it's, it certainly slows your thought process down. You become curious for a different reason than just what the content. But it also shows, I think, what they were, uh, hopefully, is the great need for medical facilities and how vulnerable they are. Hospitals, as soon as they became known, locations are only known by numbers in Syria, for instance. Clinic, they don't even say number 12. They're listening on the phone, the intelligence, the police people. They bomb it. So nothing is sacred there at this point. And the vulnerability of a room, in particular, the supply, the inventory of medical supplies. Uh, life is just dirt, broken, down on the floor, finished, empty. But it's a good question. You saw it. It is a detail, and it's very different from the human. From the other versions, and that's a good thing that you picked up because it is a very different moment. Right? It is about. I mean, can you believe that's a hospital floor? I mean, that's kind of crazy, right? But that's that's what somebody's getting trained. It's getting it's helped. Um, so it is something the photographer you know, made a conscious decision to put a photograph and then include in the entry in the contest of it because it helps give you a more detailed, nuanced view of that room that he was in, right? So you have a sense of how crowded it is, you have a sense of how chaotic it is. Now you have a sense of both, you know, just the state that it's in and what you find. So I think what really impressed the photographer, and yet you do have to read the caption, is that this is outside a uh, a damaged newborn nursery, so for babies. So nothing is sacred there. Everything is a target. A missile strike. And, and all of this takes place in the same neighborhood of Damascus. Yes? Um, hey, I'm Edwin. I'm a student in the Bronx Photo League. Um, I, you know, I, I look at a lot of this work and I think about how it particularly applies to like my generation and my current time frame in terms of photojournalism and storytelling. And I think, you know, where, like back then, there was more photographers traveling to Afghanistan to tell these stories and going to remote places. Where do you think is, what do you think is the state of storytelling nowadays? Where do you think there's potential to tell these stories uh, for the new, for the next generation of photojournalists? Well, I mean, one thing is, is, chronologically, this is only a year and a half ago or two years ago, right? I mean, so it's still pretty current. A year. A year ago, right? Yeah, yeah. December. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the question is, is it's a good one. I mean, the, the state is that it's always in flux and it's always changing. The, the, I mean, I mean, it's not a cop-out answer, but I mean, I think it, it just depends on what story you want to tell, right? It's, it's not so much what the world wants from you, it's like, what do you want to tell the world? What's the story that's most important to you and that has 
that causes you to, you know, to stay up at night and think about it and wake up with a thought about, that's the story that needs to be told next. And I can't tell you what that is. You know, when, I, when John and I have conversations about the stories he wants to do, whether it's in Africa or it's in the border, it's, it's something that is, what do we, what, what is it that we want to say and how do we best say it? Um, I think the beauty with a photo essay or a photo story is like there isn't one right thing and it doesn't, you know, I, I don't, you don't have to go overseas to tell an important story. It could be in your neighborhood, it could be in your country, it could be in your state. It doesn't, the, the traveling part is almost beside the point of telling the story, right? You don't have to go overseas. Absolutely, there are stories overseas that merit being told. Um, but it, it's like, I'll throw that back to you, is what matters to you and why aren't you telling that story? Maybe you are, and you need help figuring out how to best tell it. Or maybe you cut it up into chunks, right? It's what's going on for you that, that has value in terms of telling the wider audience what that story is. Do you have an interest in traveling for photography? Um, no. I feel like there's been there's such a like proliferation now of like for example photographers who are from the place that you're going to that can tell the story better because they're embedded they're part of the community they're part you know they understand it they see it better um, so it's just like I don't know this is like an, a, a, I mean not this because this is fairly recent but also it's also um, you know pho like photojournalists who work for larger outlets sure. Um, and who have a lot of experience in this work, you know, um, you know, many of them get their mentorship or their, 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 they learned at a time when a lot of people were kind of just traveling somewhere, somewhere else to tell a story, you know? Um, I don't know, why didn't they do it back then? Why, what, like, why, I mean, why is it, uh, I'm not sure. It's become much easier technically. Yeah. I mean, to be able to shoot Kodachrome within a third of a stop, focus your camera correctly, get the film out, match the captions up, you know, from thousands of miles away was, um, you know, very, very complex. I mean, you can train, and I was there, and John, I think, helped train Iraqi photographers, and, um, you know, you, you, we could train local photographers to shoot digitally, put the camera on auto, and they could get usable, good usable photos, and they were much better at getting into situations as you yourself just said, you know. This is a Syrian photographer, right? Yeah, I think he, is, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he, yeah. he couldn't come, they wouldn't let him come, so he accepted the award by, by video, but he was a, the one in Syria, he was a Syrian. I, I mean, I think technology has made everything much more egalitarian, right? There's much more of those folks that you talk about, like this photographer. I think the Time Magazine Photographer of the Year was a, a Syrian photographer as well. Right, technology, you go back to the Arab Spring three, four, five, six years ago, you had guys in Egypt putting stuff up on YouTube and sharing it, so they were all local. I think those folks that you talk about that were kind of local folks, were, you know, that, that wasn't possible to do because there was no platform to share it, and suddenly we learned a, a bunch of voices in these countries. One, that needed to be, to see what they were going to say, because they were there and they were living it every day. Two, it was dangerous for Western photographers to go in there uh, because they were targeted. And three, they were just doing good work. Locals right? are know. also targeted. Yeah, locals them. are always targeted. Definitely. But it's, they're doing good work. It's not just that they're locals, that they're locals are doing good work, right? And I think it's the combination of, of those things that makes the difference. But Pancho, don't you also think it's interest, It's important for foreign photographers to come look at America? And, but I was going to say, it's like, it's like when you, you, you have a point there, but it's also when a foreign photographer comes to your neighborhood, he sees things differently. And if you go somewhere else, you're, it's like that fresh eyes thing. Right? <coughs> you, you get so used to seeing things one way, you don't see it anymore. So when you go someplace, you've noticed things that for others, it's part of their day-to-day -day and they go right by. Right? It doesn't have to be one or the other. There's room for all for the next four years, there's going to be a lot of topics here to poke around. <laughs> so, <laughs> social issues. There is no and I think that's, that's a challenge, stuff. really, to tell it properly. In, in the Rust Belt areas, Western Pennsylvania, coal industry will never come back, even though it was promised by one of the candidates. Now the president-elect, that's where you can find stories. And it's a bus trip, for instance. You can also do a story on the bus to that particular story. And those are great stories. So there are many, many different ways to enterprise this, but there's also less of a sustainable profession out there now to find a position in. It's harder. Funds have to come from other places, not just from a publication. Do you think that the quality of visual storytelling is as good today as it was back then? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It's more closely scrutinized, perhaps? I, 
you know, fake news, <coughs> one of the topics, a fake photograph is picked up pretty quickly. It is no doubt, no doubt harder to make a professional living than Bob's. We had an opening this year for a staff photographer from New York at over 500 applications. Do you think we still hold the same credibility we had once? I mean, I think that's a really difficult question to ask. I mean, a credibility to who, to which audience? There's more choice now. Yeah, I don't. If you want to be alt-right, you can be alt-right in photography. I mean, I think that's the trick. It's credible to who are you trying to be credible to? Who are you trying to tell that story to? Um, right? I mean, I, I but the media has to police itself. Definitely. I think the good stories and the good visuals rise up. They still do because I think people do care. Um, I think that part hasn't changed. I think the way people can, you got to separate the platform from the story, right? And I think that's sometimes gets kind of complicated today. And that's going to be a challenge for us. Do you have a question? Yeah, I came in late, but um, where do you see video as a component in terms of with the skill set for, for the journalists? Um, are you getting pressure from publishers to incorporate that as a skill set? Do you use it? Do you look for it? Um, we, I, I, we don't get pressure again, but there is pressure for video. I, I think the challenge is, and, and we've seen this for the last decade, is, as especially newspapers ran, I mean, I, I tell a story of my friend who was the director of photography at the Dallas Morning News. You know, his publisher was running through the newsroom yelling, video, video, video. And they got rid of all their staff photographers and went to videographers, and they realized that, you know, video is really hard. It takes more time. Right? Making a still photograph is not easy, but once you have it, you can get it out if you know what you want, put a caption on it, move it pretty fast, right? Video is a different beast. Um, and um, I think the business model interfered with the professionalism of just good video for a while. And I think, the, I think it's trying to recover. I, I think it's not, you know, Daniel Barrett, who like last week had a great treatment in the New York Times for his work in the Philippines on the murders there. And I think, look at that, it's, it's, you know, it's not video per se, but it's a moving narrative. And if you look at what the Times did with the way they did it in terms of graphics and photos and Daniel's comments, and I think there's even a podcast, it's not, it's not video by itself. It's like, how do you take and incorporate all these pieces into something that is storytelling? So it's not even just about video anymore. I think it's more about combining when it needs to be combined. Maybe the picture should just run by themselves. But if it has the ability to help tell a deeper, richer story, is how do you combine those pieces? So it's not strictly a video thing. And the truth too is, for video, it's it's tough, right? Still, still sell really well because they tell that story that the photographer wanted to tell, and then they tell multiple stories further down the line as other things come up that people want to illustrate with it. Video is tough because it's that one point of view, and that's kind of it. And it's not a criticism of it, but it's just different. If you expect a still photographer to, to do both at a very high capability level, it's different size of the brain. You have to put one down and pick up the other. To do them simultaneously, which is what an editor may think a person can do, I, I, the quality does suffer from one over the other, stills versus video. So you have these one-person bands now where somebody has to do radio or audio delivery, you do some video on your iPhone, and you have a still camera. And that takes a lot of time. And you may spend too long in a particular situation and, and stay too long to do another form of the media. And a shell may land, whereas if you were just doing one, you're out the door, you're, you're, you're moving to another place. But it does put a, the burden on the individual and the organization on what they expect from one person for the same pay. And we're lucky. I don't, you know, for me, I get it. We don't, we don't tell photographers, you have to shoot video at every event you go to. Um, it's situational. Does this make sense here? John was on the border. He went from the, Atlantic, from the Pacific all the way to the Gulf. Shot almost all stills, but he did some Instagram stories. You know what? Really awesome at it. Um, but it wasn't all the time, and it's a different audience. So the trick is, it's not just video for video's sake. It's like, when does it make sense to tell a better story? I understand that I'm in a little bit of a privileged position that I am not forced to do video all the time. So it's a harder conversation in other places. But it's that trick that it's not all or nothing, right? And I think that's the challenge is, is what medium best tells a story? 
and that conversation still needs to happen because that's an essential part of just good journalism, good editorial decision making. It's like, what's the best way to tell a story? And it just can't be knee jerk still to video. It's going to be a combination of them sometimes, or maybe one or the other. But yeah, if somebody's got good video experience, it always helps. Because they think differently, right? Shooting video is different than shooting stills. Well, can we, we've got to get these kids yeah. home soon. Okay. Is there one more question? Does somebody have a, have a, have another quick question? Yes, ma'am. On the final, um, on the third photographer, the, his final photograph, you guys mentioned that he won an award for it. Do you want to elaborate on it? Yeah. This is the one you want to lose? Did you say that? He, I don't think I did. He, he wanted to work for the for all of the material in a book, as a book. Do you want to know like what makes this picture special? Yeah. Is that what you mean? What do you think is interesting about it? Um, it's very abstract. I don't understand what it is. Um, I think that was his intention. Yeah. Do you know what it is that she's wearing? No. It's a burqa. It's a full body cover that women just have a screen over their face to look through. And it's a traditional uh, religious dress that some families insist that their women over the age of 13 or 14 wear. Not all have to wear it, but um, they're incredibly hot and rather dangerous in traffic, for instance. But uh, you'll see it particularly in the Middle East. This is in Peshawar, Pakistan. It's an Afghan refugee camp. And the whole identity is taken away from a person when you see that. There's no way you know the person where that could be a, a man trying to get away, but um, they look at the ankles. <laughs> <laughs> Photographers have X-ray vision, you know. Like, that's definitely a woman. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a trust woman. But there's a. If you do take a look at the book, there's a lot of mystery and unknown that the photographer wanted to call your attention to. And the struck. He's from Australia. And when you're put down in a place that you are definitely like being on Mars, an alien, you grip. You have a fresh eye and a fresh approach to something like this. Whereas an Afghan, they, they grow up with women wearing burqas. Don't expect for a woman to take it up and address you. They'll talk right through the cloth. You definitely have some books upstairs that show other versions of women in burqas that give you a better sense of it. But in a conservative Pashtun area, all the women would be wearing this tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of women would dress like this. Once they leave the house, inside the house, they don't have to wear it with their own family once they go on. Thank you. Good question. Well, um, I think, I mean, I'm sure you'll stay for a couple of more yeah. minutes. I just want to, sure, you guys have to get home. You can stop here. And then whoever wants to stop and chat and talk for a few minutes, that would be great. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.